Hello everyone, we're here today to talk about the historical developments of the climate change regime. The reason why we're talking about this today is because, as we all know, uh, COP25 in Madrid is coming up. And many people don't even know what a COP is. They don't even know what the climate regime is. So today, we're here to tell you and to make a brief presentation about the whole uh, history and historical developments of climate regime. So today with me, I have my loved colleagues, uh, Sean and Amilda, and here we go. Sean, give you the word. Thanks, Julia. Hi, everyone. I'm Sean Burkett. I study environmental science in Canada, and I'm here today to talk to you about the difference between what the IPCC is, what the COP is, what all those mean, and what they do. So let's get started. And now I want to call on our other colleague, Alvilda. Hi guys, I'm Alvilda. Uh, I'm from Norway and I study political science. And I will also be here to talk about like the historical development when it comes to climate regimes. And I hope you enjoy the presentation. All right, everyone. So we're going to start by talking about a very important concept about regimes. But not a lot of people know what a regime, a regime actually is. So here it says, a regime is an institution charged with making global policy that countries will agree to follow without a global policy or political body to enforce them. So the regime that we are talking about is the climate change policy, but it's important to know that there are more than one policy. It's not just the climate change policy. On the bottom here, we have examples of other regimes. We have the ozone regime, very important, biodiversity regime, fisheries regime, and desertification regime. So today we're talking about the climate regime, but uh, it's important to know history, what happened before the climate regime was made. So the climate regime is included in a very broad regime called the environmental regime. And there's a few things that happened before the climate change regime so there's a first phase, and then a little bit of a transition phase, and second phase, which comes into what the climate regime is. All right, let's start now to take a look into the first phase. Why is the first phase, why do we look at the first phase? Well, we look into the first phase because basically it is the phase which led to the creation of the climate change regime, which is exactly what we're gonna talk about today. The first phase goes from the 60s to the 80s, and it is a phase where the governments started to realize that there were some environmental problems. Again, it was 1960s, so many, many years back then. Um, so again, we have the establishment of the first government institutions. So the first government institutions, the first government organs and bodies who um, were created exactly because uh, they wanted to tackle some environmental issues. Uh, the difference between the first phase and the second phase is mainly the fact that in the first phase, governments were taking a direct approach to the problem. For instance, they started to realize that air pollution in multiple cities was super bad, or that uh, there were some toxic, uh, there were some toxic waste produced by um, industries which was polluting the water. But it was basically a single direct approach to a single issue. So there were th th there were no connections made between the different issues like today. Um, the, the, the conference that we have to point out in this first phase is the Stockholm Conference of 1972. So what happened during the Stockholm Conference? Um, it was first of all announced by the United Nations uh, to provide guidelines for action to the government, to different governments and international organi organizations to protect the environment. And this happened in 1972. In 1972, we already realized that the environmental problems were problems that had to be tackled in a sort of uh, coordinated action. And well, what we need, really need to take into consideration is the creation of the United Nations uh, Environmental Pro Program, the one that now we know as the UNEP, was created right here after the uh, 1972 uh, Stockholm Conference. And what I also need to tell you is that also in this year, in 1972, a uh, very interesting report was, um, was published, it's called Limit to Growth, and it tells us that, that um, the growth that the world was embracing back then was not sustainable, and the resources we had uh, were 
not unlimited, they were limited. And this report, again, was published as everything that happened right here in 1972. So the awareness exists and it's, it's been there forever, for so many years. Okay, so now we have a transition period which goes from the 1980s to the 1990s. And what I need to point out here is that we have the Brundtland Report, the Montreal Protocol, and the Rio Earth Summit. And what is uh, fundamental with the Brundtland Report, which happened in 1987, is that the term sustainable development was uh, represented, uh, which says a lot because it was already started here. And then we have the Montreal Protocol in 1987, uh, we, where, uh, which was represented in order to start to solve the, um, the soon layer issues and also the Son regime was represented and it's known for having very uh, successful negotiations. And the Rio Earth Summit of 1992, um, where all the different nations realized that they actually needed to go together and cooperate in order to solve the different environmental issues. Okay guys, so now we have the Rio Earth Summit of 1992 and this was the period where the different nations started to realize that they actually need to cooperate together in order to find solutions on the climate problems. So um, what, is, what is very uh, very important with this period that it, is it because it got more attention to the production of toxic waste and also um, they tried to find alternative sources for energy to replace uh, fossil fuels and also they realized how much the public transport w w was actually polluting, polluting the different, different countries and different states and also how much water they used to for example produce um, like meat for example and so they started to realize that they actually have a limited supply of water but the most important part of this period is that you got the agreement on the climate change convention so this was actually the introduction to the climate change regime, so that is what is so important. Don't forget, the climate change convention divides countries into three categories. First category is the Annex 1 countries, these are developed countries and economies in transition. Annex 2, which is just developed countries, and non-annex countries, which are developing countries. So, let's get into the second phase. So the second phase uh, began in the 90s and is the phase that we are currently in right now. And guys, this is a very, very important phase that we're in because it goes over some really important uh, topics for talking. First one is the long-term environmental burdens. Another one is a more systematic perspective to look at things and the importance of combining the environment and the economy together. This one is very important because this hasn't really been looked at before. And of course, uh, international uh, business and international communities as well. All right, before getting started um, and talk about the very uh, important steps of the, of the recent negotiation processes, uh, I think it's very important to state what is actually IPCC and what is a COP. Because everyone is talking about it, it's everywhere. It's on social media, it's on newspaper, it's, it, newspapers, it's on magazines. But what is actually the IPCC and what is a COP? What is the difference between the two of them? So an IPCC is the International Panel of, on Climate Change and is the United Nations body for assessing social science related to climate change. So what, is, what it is basically, it's a bunch of scientists and again, it's scientists, it's not a Wilder, Sean and I, it's actual workers, scientists, working groups working together towards a scientific um, proof that climate change is actually man-made and what uh, are the effects of climate change. So um, it provides regular assessments of, on, of the scientific basis of climate change. It actually, the IPCC provides more than a thousand assessments and reports every year uh, to prove what climate change is. And it was created in 1988, which makes us understand that this IPCC exists and has been existing for so long. And it was created by the World Meteorological Organization and the UNEP, so the United Nations Environment, Environmental Program that we talked about before. So it has a structure. Um, 
the IPCC has a structure. It, it is actually uh, made of different uh, working groups, and at the very end there are authors, contributors, and reviewers that publish what the IPCC found out. So right now, what is the difference between the IPCC and the COP? What is the COP? So the COP is the supreme decision-making body of the Convention of Climate Change. Um, the key task is, is to review national communications and emission inventories submitted by parties and progress made. So a COP is a conference of parties. So it is a conference where parties come together, when different countries come together, together every year, they gather to find common solutions, to collaborate, to cooperate, uh, to solve the issues of climate change. And, well, we're not going to go through every single COP that was out there, but you guys can have a sort of overview of all the COPs that went on from COP1, which happened in Berlin in 1995, but the actual COPs we're going to focus on are, are the most important ones. So, we are going to talk about the Kyoto Protocol, which was COP3 in 1997. We are going to talk about the Copenhagen Accord, COP15 in 2009, and then we're going to talk about, of course, COP21, which is the Paris Agreement 2015. So now we're going to talk about the Kyoto Protocol of 1997, and here you have an overview over the different countries that signed and ratified the Kyoto Protocol, and what is noticeable about this like overview is that the US, uh, they signed the Kyoto Protocol, but they did not ratify the Kyoto Protocol. And then we go to a bit of the different facts about the Kyoto Protocol. And what is fundamental about this period is that it was very general commitments and they only had very modest targets. Um, and an example is that they needed to keep emissions to a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. And it also said that uh, the, in, like the developed, developed countries needed individual emission targets, adding up to a total cut of 5% compared to 1990 levels. Um, and they also need to have a stricter reporting and review procedures. And the me mechanism in order to achieve this was uh, joint implementation, clean development mechanism, and emission, uh, and emission trading. Uh, it's also, uh, it's also pretty, like, fundamental because uh, there were different targets between developed and developing countries. And the reason of this is because of his historical uh, reasons, because the developed countries could ask the, the developing countries, why should we uh, like, have so much responsible when you actually were the one who like, polluted our, our, our countries? And also, um, the common rules, it also had the common rules for the CO2, uh, and that was actually the, like, the, the, the agreement they got to in the Kyoto Protocol. Alright guys, now we're going to be talking about um, post-Kyoto era. So, it wasn't a great time, uh, lots of countries were experiencing uh, economic depressions, lots of the developing countries in uh, Southeast Asia, the Asian Tigers, and the OECD countries, which are mostly developed countries. So. It wasn't a good time economically for everyone. Um, there are some divisions between uh, developed and developing countries over the regime. So the developed countries wanted to have a second round of the Kyoto talks to uh, make more ambitious uh, targets, but the developing countries did not want to, which makes sense because of this economic recession. It would make sense for them to focus more on economy rather than more ambitious uh, environmental goals. And one of the reasons why the U.S. did not ratify the Kyoto Agreement was because they thought that developing countries should uh, have more of a role in reducing emissions. So after the uh, after the Kyoto post Kyoto era, we go into the next big uh, talk, which is the Copenhagen Accord. So there was huge, huge hype for this accord. It was supposed to be the thing that would like the following of the Kyoto Protocol. This would be this would send us into great, great uh, regimes and great ideas, but it was a huge failure. Like, it did not work out at all. So, actually, two years before Copenhagen Accord, so early 2007, people were making drafts of paper, 200 plus uh, drafts of paper that were going to be presented and hopefully signed off in the Copenhagen Accord, but 
That didn't happen at all. And in fact, the last 48 hours of the Copenhagen Accord was scrambling to cover up this huge failure. And in the end, they only produced two and a half pages worth of paperwork. That is, that's pathetic, that's nothing. Um, before, there was, there was uh, some references that uh, uh, to reduce emissions by 50% by 2050, and that was nowhere to be seen in the Copenhagen Accord. So again, huge failure. Seven countries uh, vetoed this, uh, Accord, um, and so since nothing was in written down, nothing was legal. Only voluntary contributions were made, so nothing legally binding, and uh, only internationally funded projects were uh, accustomed to be monitored and to have reporting on them. All right, guys. So I just want to go over one more time why the Copenhagen Accord was such a failure. So there's four reasons. First one, it was a non-binding political declaration. So the countries that said that they would uh, uh, do an emissions reduction, they were, it was voluntary. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a legal thing and in no way it was binding. Uh, there were no global targets actually set in, uh, in the, uh, the whole accord. There were some mentions of what was going to come, but nothing was actually going to be said. Uh, an unspecified list of countries, so Again, it wasn't legally binding, everything was voluntary, so if the countries that said that they would meet a reduction didn't meet it, it wouldn't really matter, I guess, because it was voluntary. And um, there's no, uh, no formal uh, adaptation or ambiguous legal status, so again, it was very, uh, very weak in content, there was nothing that really came out of it. Again, it was two and a half pages over that whole time of the Copenhagen Accord, nothing really came of it, so. You see, that's why we see uh, the Copenhagen Accord as a failure. All right, guys. So finally, we're getting to the juice. We're getting to the very inter interesting point. We're getting to one of the most important fundamental conferences of parties of all the time. The Paris Agreement, also known as COP21, and it happened in 2015, but it was implemented just one year later in 2016. So we're gonna get, um, this picture already shows the fact that the Paris Agreement is considered a big success. Let's go uh, take a look to what actually happened and why the Paris Agreement was actually considered a big success. So let's look at it. So it was considered a huge success, first of all, because almost every country on this earth agreed and actually reached an agreement, a global agreement, um, 120 uh, and 95 countries uh, signed, um, and some countries were not there, for instance, Syria and Nicaragua, you probably can find other countries who were not there uh, if you look it up online. But um, anyways, why was it so important? Because after the Copenhagen Accord was such a failure, and after the Copenhagen Accord was not legally binding, um, on the contrary, the Paris Agreement, agreement finally had some voluntary pledges. Voluntary pre pledges, it, it, it means that every country each year, starting from the Paris Agreement, has to submit some NDCs, which is nationally determined contributions. Every year, every country has to write a list of ambitions, a list of targets that they, they, they have to be even more ambitious every year, so each year the targets of each country has to get more ambitious. And, well, these voluntary pledges are not actually legally binding, but what they have to do, what it has to be mandatory, is the fact that these pledges are tracked, and they are checked by a community of scientists who tells the countries whether or not they are on track with their goals. So we have this process called naming and shaming, um, every uh, nationally determined contribution is official and it is um, actually available to the public and what also is, is available to the public is whether or not a country is on track. Um, also, let's talk about the goals. We are finally talking about numbers, but what kind of numbers are we talking about in the Paris Agreement? So, usually people talk about this 1.5 degrees, but actually, actually, uh, the official goal is no more than two degrees of global warming, but the aspiration is 1.5 degree because we're going to need a more ambitious target and net zero emissions, net zero emissions between 20, 2050 and, um, 
and um, uh, 2100. So what is going to happen is also the fact that we're going to have a green climate found. We have a green, green climate found with um, 100 um, US billion dollars per year to help with the process of mitigation and adaptation and to help developing countries uh, towards climate change, um, the, towards uh, tackling climate change. Um, and also, of course, the cooperative approach between countries is um, a point that an element that we cannot really forget because finally all of these countries reached an agreement. Uh, very quick, we're going to go through the technical aspect of the Paris Agreement. So let's let's see it. Uh, it's well, of course, we know that there are long-term goals. Article two, um, paragraph four is the article talking about the nationally determined contribution. We have the process of mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation is the process where we're, where we're starting to uh, tackling global warming and we're starting to reduce our emissions. Adaptation is the process where, well, what is done is done and we have to help uh, to, to adapt to global, uh, to global warming. We also have this interesting part, the loss and damage part. So uh, countries which are already damaged and um, like how are they gonna get help? They're probably gonna receive money from the climate fund. Uh, transparency, article uh, 13 is also important because we said that every country has is subjected to control to their of, of their national targets. Uh, finance, we already talked about it, and this cooperative approach which includes a te technology transfer, so um, technology uh, to tackle climate change is gonna be um, transferred from a country to another, and the capacity building, so the fact that countries are gonna work all together and cooperate towards um, the same uh, big goal. So, well, Paris Agreement was a big su success, but now I'm calling up my colleague, who is going to talk about why and what unresolved issues um, had the Paris Agreement. So even though the Paris Agreement was successful, there still remain some unsolved problems or issues. We actually have some updated data here from UNFCC, which says that we're still far away from reaching our two degrees Celsius goals. So um, if like a nation, all the nations contributes the way they're supposed to do, there will still result in a global warming of 2.7 above pre-industrial levels, which shows that it's still, we still need to do a lot. And also, in order to get uh, like orientation in how we, where we are when it comes to the, the greenhouse emissions levels, uh, we have 52.7 gigaton carbon um, level in 2014, uh, which need to be brought down to 48 um, gigaton by 2000 and, uh, 2025. And also, in uh, 2020, it needs to be brought down to 42 gigaton. And the most important is that we need, uh, we need a net zero by uh, like between 2060 and 2075. And so what do we need to do in order to keep uh, the degrees to 1.5 Celsius? So that's what you see here. The CO2 emissions would need to be declined by 45% before 2030. And also the re renewable energy will need to be supplied with 70 to 80% of power by 2050. But are the countries on track? So as Alvilda said before, if all the countries follow their uh, nationally determined contributions, the warming of the earth would be at 2.7 degrees Celsius, which isn't even close to the 1.52 degrees Celsius that Paris Agreement wants. So here we got a, uh, a map of if the countries are on track or not. This is from the uh, Climate Action Tracker, which is a group of scientists and researchers that um, they follow up to see if countries are actually on track, and it puts it uh, on the map. See, this was updated since uh, September 2019, so very recent data we're working with. This isn't like 2015, this is very, very recent. So um, this right here, this section here, is between 2 degrees Celsius and 1.5 degrees Celsius, and the vast majority of countries are not even there. So we got really bad, uh, we've got the, the bad guys here, critically insufficient. This is, uh, if they, they'll be above uh, 4 degrees Celsius. So we got big players like Russia, we got the US, Turkey, Interesting. Uh, we've got uh, insufficient 
uh, my, my home uh, country, Canada, is insufficient. That's too bad. Come on, Justin. Um, we got Norway here, Alveolda's home country is also not doing so well in the EU. And uh, the only, the, the best uh, countries that are doing the best are Morocco and the Gambia, which is two countries in Africa, which I think is kind of interesting. But um, yeah, so overall, it's not looking good at all. All right, well, last but not least, we wanted to leave you guys with some data on uh, current emission levels. So these are data from, uh, drawn from the Union of Concerned Scientists, is another group of scientists, another, another group of researchers, and it's still 2019, I don't know if you can read it, but it's a very, very recent, so we were talking about recent data. Um, what we notice here is basically the chunk of emission of every country now, like recently, in 2019. Well, it's probably not going to be surprise, like surprising that this is China. So 25% of the world emission, according to this graph, this is not pro capita, by the way, this is a state emission. So again, if you want more data, of course, we, we know that data cannot be um, the same. So different research, research, researches uh, show different data. And well, in this case, we, we can give you guys an idea of what this research uh, shows us. So again, this is China, uh, which is like accounts for 29% of global emissions. United States for 16%, rest of the world for uh, 19%. Um, I'm gonna give you some fast, uh, fast chat effects, uh, such as Italy for 1%, uh, but you guys probably can just look up for some more data because again, uh, if you look up for data for uh, pro capita emissions or for state emissions, it's, it's extremely, extremely different and it's going to show different results. But all in all, we can have an idea of how, um, how it looks like. Anyways, so this is going to be the conclusion. Um, thank you so much for staying with us and for being so patient and for uh, yeah, following all of this presentation. We hope you liked it and we hope that uh, it wasn't too boring and we hope that now you have um, more uh, broader knowledge or more information about what the climate regime is, what the environmental regime is and what is going on right now on our planet. Um, well, we also hope you will follow uh, the developments in uh, COP25 in Madrid and we hope that now you are going to be able to understand what needs to happen in order to keep the temperature down. So we are going to need ambitious change. Thank you so much for being with us guys and till next time, maybe after COP25 with new updates from Julia, Alvilda and Sean. Bye!